We're all familiar with the stories of the early pioneers in the state of Israel, the draining of swamps, building new homes and towns for immigrants from around the world, the effort required to build a new country. Ben-Gurion's own vision for the future of the state was framed by his belief that uh, its future lay in its ability to deploy science and technology to conquering the Negev Desert. That vision has been realized today in the form of Ben-Gurion University, established less than 50 years ago. A university is situated in Besheva, at the northern end of the Negev Desert. You know, being located in the desert on Israel's periphery creates a culture, an attitude of determination to overcome obstacles, an attitude characterized by Ben-Gurion University's researchers and academics. But for now, I'd like to share a glimpse into the future, a look at Ben-Gurion University and the Negev in 2045. Right now we're in the middle of a, a revolution. From the moment the intellectual capabilities of computers surpassed our own, we crossed this technological barrier and we entered the realm of morality. When my family moved here from Tel Aviv in 2017, I was only nine years old and it was still considered a pioneering act. Now, if you want to engage in research on cybersecurity or water technologies, Be'er Sheva is a global center. When Prime Minister Netanyahu declared Be'er Sheva Israel's cyber capital 30 years ago, many Israelis felt that they heard it all before. But BGU embraced his role as a producer for top human capital for what was proudly called Silicon Wadi. Nobody's doubting now. The Negev was never just a location. It was a mission and a commitment. We always saw ourselves as a part of the community and aspired to be a catalyst for the development of the area and through it to inspire Israel and the rest of the world. I remember when student volunteers from the university came to my high school to teach science. For me, it was a life-altering experience. It made me want to be a student, go to university, and I think that's how change begins, through the children. And this is what Ben Gurion University of the Negev does. It is the interface of higher education, society, government, and industry that has catapulted the state of Israel and the whole region forward. We believe everything is intertwined. It's the synergy between fields that are seemingly not connected. Cybersecurity, robotics, medicine, alternative energy that serve as the basis for the unbelievable results we have achieved. You could actually say that our water-related technological developments help define the new Middle East. The ability to monitor water through microfluidic devices and the highly sustainable desalination membranes used in plants that run on photovoltaic energy were all developed here at BGU. And they have brought with them an abundance of water for the whole Middle East. This is the foundation of the constructive cooperation and peace with Jordan and the rest of the countries in our region. It has also allowed us to restore the Dead Sea and its status as one of the world's most unique natural phenomena. The ability to target diseased cells was the key factor in defeating cancer. Since then, we have already developed the first generation of implanted nanocells that maintain our body 24-7, preventing diseases and cancers, fighting viruses, and even slowing the aging process. Technologically, we've achieved some unprecedented breakthroughs in the last few years. Our robots are highly intelligent and they're capable of performing very complicated tasks. From helping the elderly, performing household duties, and uh, performing dangerous jobs that keep people safe. Yet they lack one thing. Feelings. See, right now we're getting very close teaching them empathy and love. But does that mean that they can also learn how to hate? Together, we're developing the next generation of AI that will encompass moral human behavior. This is one of the main reasons that I decided to leave MIT and I returned to Israel. I guess dealing with these moral issues felt more natural doing it here in Israel, closer to my Jewish holy and literary sources, and 
and closer to the Big Bang Region's heritage. When BGU celebrated its 50th anniversary 25 years ago, it celebrated the donors who believed in the dream. Not only did they make this beautiful North Campus possible, which doubled the university's size, but they also helped us exponentially grow our influence on the most important priorities of the global agenda. I really believe the Nobel Prize we won belongs to all of us. Well, everybody knows that our main goal is to significantly shorten the travel time to Mars and also to increase the amount of freight that can be carried by space shuttles flying there. What most people don't know is that we are relying on the PICO satellite technology developed at Ben Gurion University. Originally, it was developed for Homeland Security purposes. The PICO technology provided our teams of scientists and engineers with the means to not only go further than ever before, but to also do it faster and better. BGU played a major role in turning Beersheba into both a desired metropolitan center, recently reaching one million residents, and an influential technological hub. Look at what we've created here. The wineries and farms, the high-speed rail to Elat, the technology that emerges from the Shabbat. In the words of David Ben-Gurion, the difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. I don't think it took that long. That's a view of vision of 2045. I sincerely hope to well and truly retired by then. But uh, many of the topics covered in that video are real. They're real today. Scientists at our Desert Research Institute were key to developing desalination technology that now provides 80% of Israel's water supply. We've developed treatments that will cure brain tumors today. Our engineers have created a commercially viable robot that you can put in your car and it'll drive the kids to school. We've even launched our own PICO satellite in July to monitor environmental changes around the globe. And all this in less than 50 years. Imagine what we'll do in the next 25. Tonight, we're here to hear, to hear more about a crucial time in history for the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And my colleague, Natan, will share insights into the Balfour Declaration in a moment, together with Charles. But before he does, I wanted to draw your attention to the brochures you'll find in your seats. Whatever your philanthropic interests or priorities, there's a chance we'll be exploring a solution. Some of the ideas, some of the concepts you saw there on the screen, they expect to be realizing those in the next 25 years. You have an opportunity to ensure that the people that we featured in that video can actually reach there by supporting them today. And that's the purpose of the Ben Gurion University Foundation, to provide opportunities to young people to study today to become tomorrow's scientists. Um, call me if you'd like to arrange a visit to Ben Gurion University the next time you're in Israel. We're an hour from Tel Aviv by train. It's very easy to get there today. Or if you'd like to learn more about the topics that interest you. And as you consider who will support this Yontif, consider becoming a partner in creating the future with Ben Gurion University. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Natan Aradan. Natan is a researcher at the Ben Gurion Research Institute for the Study of Israel and Zionism. He's editor of the Israel Studies Journal. He arrived in Israel with the assistance of the Ben Gurion University Foundation in 1980 and has never looked back. I'm also delighted to introduce Dr. Charles Landau, whom I'm sure is known to many of you. He lectures on Jewish history and comparative religion and has lectured in the House of Commons, synagogues, churches, universities, and many other institutions, both here and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. My name is Dr. Nathan Ridan, and you've come to listen, to discuss about the Balfour Declaration. And I will talk for a few minutes, and then with my colleague, we will discuss in greater detail about the Balfour Declaration. This is the view 
near my institute at Stebble Care. This is Bereshit. This is Genesis. This is the creation of where great religions have come from the desert. And it is very, very inspiring. This is something which I found, and I wanted to give you some idea about Ben Gurion. I know, again, you hear about uh, Balfour. Um, someone wanted to give money to um, setting up um, a university in Beersheba. And Ben Gurion talks about the college at Stebble Care. This is a vision in 1963. What he basically talks about later on is that um, all his life um, he's been considered crazy. But that's what having visions are about. Um, and over here, he writes over here at the bottom, not only would not I regard your plan as a lunatic one, but I myself was engaged all my life in lunatic ideas. And many of them have become facts and important factors in life here. And this was seven years before the university was even created. I teach diplomacy and one of the things, and I'm gradually getting into the Balfour Declaration, and diplomacy is the art of letting someone else have your way, is called marriage. I, I once asked uh, my friend's parents, who have been married now for 70 years, what the recipe for their marriage was, and they both said the right to use a veto. History does not repeat itself, but historians repeat each other. And um, there is still no um, um, understanding of what we do with the dissolution of the um, former Ottoman Empire. One of my favorite quotes is taken from Harry Potter. Many of you who are grandparents perhaps have also read it for the first time with your grandchildren. But he talks about it is not, it is, and this is, I'm being serious about leadership, it is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are more than our um, abilities. And so we as human beings we're coming up to how your mim or im, the days of war, we are judged not by what we say, what we thought, or what someone else thinks. We are judged by what we do. And that is something that when we look back in history, um, that, that we do. Balfour, um, Arthur James Balfour, who was foreign minister and was responsible for signing the letter um, on the 2nd of November. Um, 1917. I'm just going to go very, very briefly because many people here have read and have read widely. Um, one of the myths um, is that somehow or other the Balfour Declaration was issued because of pro or philo uh, Semitism, that people were pro Jewish and therefore had sentiments. All I can tell you is beware of Greeks bringing gifts. No one has ever offered anything to the Jewish people without a price. And when I go and I teach diplomacy and I look at the votes of the UN vote on Palestine in 1947, there wasn't one country out of the 56 or the 57 countries that voted, not one, that voted because they felt sorry for the Jews. When I analyze every country's vote, it had to do with their own interests. So we have to be very, very careful when people write books about what they think should have happened with something else. The other thing, um, before we go into uh, the discussion, is that those people who are anti-Zionist, anti-Israel, are now trying to rescind the Balfour Declaration. They are trying to get the British government to apologize about issuing the declaration. And this shows the, not only the chutzpah, but it shows the utter ignorance of why the Balfour Declaration was issued. This theory that somehow or other the British government was hoodwinked by these Zionists and these Jewish conspirators and those ministers and the prime minister really didn't understand what was going on shows an utter, um, I think, utter um, dissemblance of why the British issued the declaration. I'm not going to take um, um, parts of what Charles would like um, to add. The, the important thing is we need to ask is that if religious motives were so important, why did it only begin to place some sort of semblance of interest in February, March 1917, 
Why not 1914? Why not 1915 or 60? And there are various reasons which both of us um, will we, we, we'll, we'll deal with. Um, the other important thing is to understand to what extent the people play a part in history. We know that history is his story, but there's also her story to the effect. And my next book, I'm writing about the contribution of women to, uh, to diaspora Israel um, relations, because there were also, which I'm not going to go into it to get now, a number of very influential women in Britain who played a part, not just Weizmann and not just um, Sokolov. But we need to understand that Britain was losing the war. Um, it, it, certainly by the beginning of 1917, Britain was losing the war. The Russians were deserting the soldiers. The French were shooting as many of their own soldiers for mutinies. Britain was on its own. And in a war, everything is done to win a war. Now, I've served in the Israeli army. I've seen people being killed. I've seen decisions um, being made. And the one thing that everyone does is everything is done to win a war. And we, we often ignore that. And what was happening was that the Ottoman Empire was collapsing and there was disagreement between the British and the French. Next slide. And uh, an agreement uh, between Sir Mark Sykes and uh, Pico, his uh, French uh, counterpart, tried to divide up what they considered to be um, their interests in the Middle East. The most important thing is that the British and the French, although they were together, the British were trying to stop any further uh, French advance. And so um, what happens is that the British uh, encouraged, there was always a Zionist movement wanting to have support from a, a foreign power, but the British encouraged the Zionist leaders to write them memoranda which they could therefore adopt. And again, I'm not going to go into it. The other thing is that the French and the Germans were also going to issue their own declaration, but they were going to promise a state uh, to the Jews. Again, without going um, on to what Charles might be talking about, we have to understand that during the First World War, there was a struggle in the British government itself as to uh, what should be happening. And the other um, question, which I think is very, very important, um, is to understand uh, what was meant by the word homeland. Talked about a Jewish homeland. We'll analyze the text later on. No one knew what it meant. When Herzl wrote his book, uh, Judenstadt, Stadt in German can be a state as it is in Germany or in the United States. And if you were to ask members of the Zionist Congress in 1897, where was Palestine? No one could define it until 1919. So the Zionist movement were asking for a homeland or a territory in Palestine, but no one could actually define what it is. So what is a homeland? Uh, what does it actually mean? We'll be looking at later on. And so what happened was the British uh, invaded uh, Palestine. Um, and again, and this is where I'm going to finish, um, the British were very concerned that they wouldn't get American support. The United States uh, was very concerned with British imperialism. Um, but if the British were going to invade Palestine and help Jews, then how could you in any way object to this? Uh, the French um, would be um, given a, a fair complet. Uh, the Germans uh, wouldn't do anything to rock the boat uh, with, the, with the Ottomans. And uh, basically, at the beginning of, of, of uh, the end of October, 1917 and the beginning of um, November, the declaration was issued, which again uh, we will look at. Um, I just wanted to sum up just a couple of, of ideas before, before we carry on, and that is what is the importance of the Balfour Declaration is perhaps more important than what the declaration is itself. If you ask many people in, in this country about uh, why they want to rescind the Balfour Declaration, 
uh, most people um, haven't, uh, haven't read it. But um, I think what's important uh, to understand, and this is why I'm going to finish, the importance of both the Balfour Declaration and the League of Nations decisions in the international recognition of pre-existing natural, historical, and legal rights of the Jewish people. People forget we were an independent nation, not just once, but twice in Eretz Israel. And those people who accuse Israel of colonialists, we were the opposite. Why were so many uh, Arab peasants angry, and I can understand it, by the way, is they had been paying for centuries rent to absentee landlords in Beirut and in Aleppo and Damascus. And when a large waves of Jews came, Ben Gurion was one of the wave, they wanted to do everything for themselves. They were terrible workers, by the way. And so as a result, the um, Falakh, the Arab peasants, were basically dispossessed. They never owned the land, but they no longer had land to work on. And their resentment wasn't against those landlords who had sold land at inflated prices. Their anger was at Jews who had actually bought the land. And the first time Jews ever went into real estate was when Avraham bought uh, the cave of Machpelah to bury Sarah. And so what's important um, is that there was a legal recognition of the rights of Jews. And what is going on in the debate on the Balfour Declaration today isn't so much the Balfour Declaration. It's the de-Judaizing of the Jewish rights to the land. I'm not going to go into it now about what the future should be of the West Bank, Yehuda Shamron, whatever you use. But if you actually look at the figures, people will be astounded to find that Jerusalem, as early as 1845, there was a majority of Jews in Jerusalem. This was before the Zionist invasion 50 years later on. And so when you will be exposed more and more to the Balfour Declaration about whether it's um, Britain should apologize, what's basically being said is that the League of Nations, which was a legal organization, supported the rights of Jews to live in their own homeland, to build up an economy for the benefit of all man and woman, humankind. Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Charles Landau. I've not met Winston Churchill. I've not met the Queen. Um, however, I have met a number of patients, and I, the, the people that I treat are actually quite interesting. Many of them are involved in the law, in the in theatre, and politics as well. And it's interesting to note that in asking each and every one of them over the last couple of weeks, as I do, you know, we have a chat before we do any treatment, um, what about the Balfour Declaration? Not one, not one had heard of the Balfour Declaration, let alone read it. So, of course, what is very important to Jews and to Israel and to the Middle East doesn't mean that the general population out there have necessarily heard of it. Mm -hmm. It is not about Jewish influence. It is not about Jewish money. It is not about Jewish wealth. It is not about the number of Jews in America that brought about the Balfour Declaration. It is, as Nathan said, entirely interest. There is a wonderful apocryphal story, maybe, but maybe not, of Ben-Gurion with de Gaulle in 1920. Ben-Gurion was visiting de Gaulle uh, in one way, well, an official visit, well, 19, also to 19, thank 19, him. 1960. 1960. Yes, de Gaulle wasn't around in 1920. Did I say 20? I you see, that's what I said, 1960, of course. <laughs> Thanking after the States. Um, that's, you just listen carefully. <laughs> so there he's visiting him in 1960, and he comes to Paris and Ben Gurion and says to de Gaulle, I want to thank you for all that you have done for Israel, for all the arms you have provided. You are a great friend of Israel. And de Gaulle looked down at Ben Gurion physically, metaphorically, actually, and said to him, Monsieur Ben-Gurion, in international politics, there are no friends.
only interests. And that, of course, is a story of the Balfour Declaration, is about British interests doing what was best for Britain at that particular time in 1917. Um, I thought that we would lead off in a different way. Um, where should we start? Should we start from... It sounds like a White House conference. Uh, yes, it does. But I'm not Trump. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay, we can start, although you, of course, mentioned that the influence of religion isn't that great, and many people put down much to philo-Semitism, although when the early Zionists and Herzl and Weizmann as well and others, when they looked around the world, they looked at England as being the place which was the natural home for mm -hmm. their endeavours. Mm -hmm. And England did have a strong history of philo-Semitism, a word which was created at the end of the 19th century, about the same time as the word anti-Semitism was created, as Zionism was created, mm -hmm. the word pogrom was created as well. And so they looked at England, and in England, all the way back to the early 19th century, 1820, and there on, there was a strong feeling that mm -hmm. the Jews, especially Lord Shaftesbury, should be returned to even what he called Eretz Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. calling it Palestine. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your views are on that. Okay, can you try and find the sides of the de declaration when you do it? First of all, um, this, is, this is very important. About It goes actually back to uh, 1657 um, with 16, during the Cromwell um, interregnum with uh, Yisrael ben Menashe when the Jews are allowed to come back. And I often ask myself, why is it that so many of our Christian brothers and sisters are so pro-Zionist and pro-Israel, but there's also a hidden meaning, and no way do I um, use this in derogatory, because the prophecy for, for um, Protestant Christians, not Catholics, there's a big difference between Catholics and Protestants, is that only when the Jews are assembled in their own homeland will the Messiah come. And when Herzl is meeting with world leaders to try and get support, uh, he, he and Sokolov meet with the Pope, and the Pope says, there is no Jewish people, there is no Jewish nation, but I've been in favor of all the Jews returning to Palestine. And they say, why? He said, then we can convert you en masse when Jesus comes. Now, this is important because those evangelicals and, and other people in this country, but more so in America, their agenda is that they love the people of Israel because the prophecy is, or part of the prophecy in the New Testament, is that when the Jews go back to their land, then the Messiah will come. So there's an interest here. Um, yes, certainly, um, and it's very, very important to understand, is that just as many as there are Christians who support Israel, there are Christians who are disin disinvesting from Israel. I was in a conversation with the... Uh, with the leader of the Church of Scotland uh, recently, uh, and the Church of Scotland decided to disinvest in Israel. And I asked them whether they were going to dismantle their lucrative hotel, the Scots Hospice uh, Hotel in Tiberias, and also less uh, lucrative in Jerusalem. Okay, no, it's not going to happen. And the, the, the pro-Jewish um, sentiments, uh, we need to ask ourselves, to what extent did this hold sway? To what extent did this influence? It influenced because you mentioned England, and it was something that we Israelis always talk about Anglia. We don't say Great Britain. Um, because um, three of the um, high commissioners of Palestine were, in fact, Scottish, and the Welsh, which Lloyd George himself was Welsh, they were brought up on the Old Testament. And they know our Tanakh, they know as well as many Jews, uh, and that um, they were the children of Israel. And they, this, I, this feeling of, of also the, you know, the church that you don't go to <laughs> in the Methodism, similar to Judaism. So there is a familiarity about Jews and about the importance of supporting but when it comes down to real nitty-gritty decisions, I don't think it held sway. But it opened doors as well. Of course, it's, yes. uh, the, the Prime Minister Aberdeen was written to by uh, Shaftesbury, and mm -hmm. it was he in 1853. Many people think it's a Zionist statement, 
who uh, coined the phrase a country without a nation for a nation without a country. And he saw that that nation were to be the Jews. Mm -hmm. Later on in 1901, by mm -hmm. Zangwill, was the first one said, mm -hmm. brought on then the statement of people without a land, a land without people. By the way, this quote was very important because I've been in debates with Palestinians and Arabs for the last 45 years, Elise will know. Um, and they always quote and misquote this Shaftesbury and the Zionism. In other words, a people without a land, a land without people. Ah, now, but it didn't mean what? No, land. but what they, in fact, what the quote was, a land without a people, in other words, a nation. There was no Palestinian nation. Um, and therefore, a land without a people for a people without a land, the Jewish people. Now, what do, um, which is very uh, clever, but um, also very annoying is that if you go onto the internet and you and you hear all, you read all these quotes, how is it quoted? A people for a people without a land, uh, uh, without land. Uh, for, in other words, there, there's no people there. Of course, there's people. Everyone knew that there were Arabs there. But at the end of 19, at the beginning of 19, at the end of the First World War, there were only 58,000 Jews in Palestine. Um, and so this, this is important that the connection and the help of, of, of Christians helping Israel, but don't in any way be hoodwinked. Uh, if you go and, and, and read what's going on with the disinvestment in Israel of many churches, the Presbyterian churches as well, uh, it's quite alarming. And so not to get this feeling that you know, all the Christians are, are with Israel, but certainly um, there was great support and it opened doors. Well, it certainly helped mm -hmm. here in England. Lord, yes. Lord uh, Shaftesbury said, in fact, when he first they enacted mm -hmm. a consul in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and there was a bishopric, the first bishop also in Jerusalem, when they were trying mm -hmm. to claim each European country would try and claim a bit of the Holy Land for themselves, the Russians, the Germans, the French and the English as well. And he said at the time when there mm -hmm. was a first consul, that the ancient city of the people of God mm -hmm. is about to resume a place among the nations, and England is the first of the Gentile kingdoms that ceases to tread her down. Mm -hmm. The wonderful story about the first bishop, who was a Michael Solomon Alexander, he was born in uh, Germany. He came to England as a young man. He became the rabbi of Norwich, although that shouldn't affect anybody, and he then became a shochet and a teacher in Plymouth, in 1825, he converted to Christianity, and he then became ultimately the bishop in Jerusalem. So a rabbi became the bishop in Jerusalem. And to Shaftesbury, this was the ultimate aim of St. Augustine would have been blessed to see mm -hmm. that a Jew and a rabbi ultimately became the first mm -hmm. bishop in Jerusalem. Uh, and the connection, of course, of Shaftesbury and Eros and uh, there at mm -hmm. Shaftesbury Avenue in recognition mm -hmm. of the great works which he did. Which, by the way, is um, very interesting. I don't think Tony Cor I don't think uh, Corbyn would um, sing this song, but if you notice that William Blake, uh, one, the hymn of the Labour Party is uh, Jerusalem, <laughs> and it's uh, to build Jerusalem, the road to Jerusalem in 1945. This was the rebuilding, this, this euphemism of help, but if I may, and we'll do it together as a double act, to actually look at the Balfour Declaration itself, the wording. Um, you know, I'll start and you can carry on. Do you okay. want to go to that now? Well, um, okay, fine. I think it's well, important. We lead to it onto well, it. Well, lead to it onto it. But um, as I say, the the, the idea, um, it's very similar. What people do, um, you know, you, one can disagree with um, Israel's policies. But Israel was the only country which basically, because of its conceived actions, um, is considered not having the right to exist. No one says that the United States doesn't have a right to exist because it was formed on slavery and, and other things. No one talks about France not having the right to exist because of Algeria or Jordan, which was an artificial state created by British imperialism, or Saudi Arabia or the Lebanon itself. And this delegitimization is important because you delegitimize the Shoah. 
In other words, if you can prove that the Shoah was a hoax, then in theory, then the state of Israel doesn't have a right to exist. If you can show or prove that the Balfour Declaration was issued because of the power, this tremendous power of the Jews, then in theory, you delegitimize the state of Israel. And this is very frightening and very worrying about rewriting history um, to try and justify your political points of view today. Right, so the Balfour Declaration came out of it the end of the 19th century. The situation of the Jews was tough in most of Europe. In Germany, there were the rise of anti-Semitic parties. In Russia, we now have from 1881 onwards, we have pogroms. In France, we now have the Dreyfus Affair. And when the First World War exploded in the world to kill umpteen tens of millions of people, all of the great empires which had existed and the great monarchs and other czars had existed before the First World War were to all disappear. And it's the Ottoman Empire which was to be crushed for their mistake of siding with Germany and to be divided, a spoil divided amongst the victors. The Jews themselves had, in Europe, worked for a hundred years and more to be finally accepted as citizens of the countries in whichever they lived, whether it was Germany, where most of the battle for acceptance went on, or in France, or here, even in England. Along come the Zionists, Herzl, Weizmann, and others, who begin to say to them, yes, you want to be German, but we say to you, Palestine is where you're going to be. We need a Jewish homeland. We need somewhere for the Jews to go, the Judenstadt, we need that. And for many Jews, this was absolutely against everything they believed in, everything they wanted, which was finally to be more German than the Germans, to celebrate Schiller's birthday, to walk the streets of Berlin proudly being more German and to smell the, uh, the trees and breathe the air of what was Germany to them. And the same thing went on around Europe. That we have to understand that with the coming of the Balfour Declaration, it wasn't quite as simple as it seems. And although the Zionists were asked to formulate a basic formula uh, to present to the war cabinet, the government, it wasn't exactly as we read in front of us. Shall we start? Just before, um, the, the points that you raised were very interesting because... If you look at uh, the Rambam, Maimonides, Jews were to be loyal to the countries that they were in. And uh, anyone who has heard my talk uh, before, um, maybe yesterday, and again, we're coming up to Yom Kippur soon. And I think it's important that people understand that why do we have Kol Nidre? Why do we say Kol Nidre three times? And the reason is that what Jews are saying around the world, Jews who are emancipated, who are begged and pleaded for equal rights, what we are saying to the Goyim, as well as to us Jews, is that we're tearing all these promises up for 25 hours. They are null and void. That is treason. That is sedition. And so the Shaliyah Tibor, the Khazan, starts whispering a bit. And then people would go outside to find out whether there any spies, because to try and justify that the Jews weren't loyal until the third time when you're absolutely convinced. Because when you think about the logic of it, you are tearing up any agreements, consensual agreements that you were given to those countries that have taken you in and you are equal citizens. And it happened in this country to the point that in the United Synagogue, where we are today, in control of the United Synagogue, um, certainly until the 50s, was Whaley Cohen and um, the Montague family. And although there was a prayer for the State of Israel in the singer's prayer book, it wasn't actually officially acknowledged until 1962. Until 1962. And so this feeling of being proud of being Jews and worried about this idea of dual loyalties. But we will go into it. Do you want to start or should I start? Just, well, whatever. Okay, the uh, November... We should the do this more often, Charles. We, we should. Yeah. 
you know, Ben Gurion <laughs> University, yeah. Um, November the 2nd, 1917, it just didn't come out of nowhere. There had been uh, months of, uh, well, for a better word, of negotiations as to what the words were to be. One thing you can say about this, it is not a legal document, the Balfour Declaration. It is not a legal document. And it is vague. Like many international documents, letters, and other such things, they remain vague in order that each side can gain out of it what they will. And we were only discussing before about Resolution 242 and the word the in the Resolution 242 and how you can read different things into it because of one word of three letters. But that's not the subject of tonight. So it begins, I'll just do the first one. Okay. Dear Lord Rothschild, so the natural question would be, why is the Balfour Declaration written to Lord Rothschild? Who is Lord Walter Rothschild? He was actually a very bizarre individual. He had um, zebras as well. Sorry? He had zebras in his house. He had, he had zebras, well he had lots of animals, but he had a carriage. Now many of us, and you've met the Queen, said, uh, the Queen's carriage is a Landau, in fact, is led by horses, uh, but Walter Rothschild's carriage was led by four zebras. He, he was... He very... saw everything in black and white. <laughs> yes. I'm glad I didn't say that one. <laughs> right. Um, Rothschilds have been asked. They were a leading Jewish family and recognized around Europe, obviously, as one of the great family, Jewish families of the world. Their influence was immense. Not all of them were Zionists. Many of them were actually anti-Zionists, but that's not the subject. But it was they that were asked, with others, to formulate a basic idea which they could put into a declaration whether it's known as the Balfour Declaration or whatever, to be put into a declaration. Why didn't they write it to Sokolov, who was the titular representative of European World Zionist Organization and was in many ways superior above uh, Weizmann, who was English Zionist Organization? Why didn't they write it to either of those? And the answer was, generally said, of course, that Sokolov himself was from Russia. He was a foreigner. And it would seem somewhat, not quite kosher, although they probably wouldn't have used that word, not quite kosher to write a declaration such as this to a foreigner. So the other person would have been Weizmann, a man who had done so much for this country in his development of acetone and other aspects of warfare for the First World War in Manchester, who was a British citizen, he had been for 10 years by then, why not write to him? It's because, of course, again, he was second to Sokolov. So you couldn't really write to the number two in the organization. So it was easier and it was better, therefore, to write to Rothschild as a leader, one of the leaders of Anglo Jury, and the man who had formulated the idea in the first place. Okay. Right. First of all, when we actually look at the uh, translation, um, I have much pleasure in conveying uh, on behalf of His Majesty's government. Now, if one looks at the Middle East conflict, one looks at negotiations, the history of diplomacy is often when someone thinks that they have the authority to act on their government and doesn't. The best example is the Mahan Agreement, of which the British representative in, in Egypt is, is considered to have promised Arabs their own uh, states after the First World War, which just wasn't true. So what we know is, this comes from the top. This was from the government. And it was very, very important that the following declaration of sympathy. Now, sympathy is great. All of us have sympathy. We don't have to do anything about it. Being sympathetic to something doesn't actually commit you, but it was done. Um, the, the important thing is, with Jewish Zionist aspirations, now, if it had just been Jewish, the longing for Zion was part and parcel of Judaism. You can't take, you can't take Judaism out of Zionism. But the recognition of the Zionist movement within 20 years of its establishment, the Zionists didn't have money, they didn't have influence, and they didn't go on Aliyah. And so this idea the idea of recognizing a political organization. Now, to recognize the PLO is much easier to understand. The PLO had clout, 
they have support they are they use terrorist methods etc and they played their important place in history and therefore the plo you can understand why not in any way am i comparing the plo to the zionist movement this was a tremendous success now the other thing is it adds it has been submitted to and approved by cabinet by the government now why is this important now tanari dan can write a memoranda like lord samuel did in uh, herbert samuel 1915 so all of a sudden charles lando comes to the archives and says, tanari dan wrote this memoranda the only thing is no one read it asquith the former prime minister never allowed anyone to actually disseminate any of these things so we learn that it has come from the government it has been discussed and approved that is something you can't take away from the uh, declaration over to you charles right so you raised the interesting point of course uh, which we maybe have left out in fact so what was the interest of the British government to go to the Jews with an offer? Why would they be interested at that point of taking a bit of the Ottoman Empire and giving it to a people that hadn't been in that land for 1,000 and X number of years? They believed, rightly or wrongly, that the Jews, in fact, did have a certain amount of influence, both importantly in Russia and in America. At that point, America was not in the war or by the time of declaration there were, but they wanted America into the war, and they believed that the Jews would have an influence in Russia in order to keep Russia in the war and fighting. We recently, or some of us have, come back from Russia on a trip, and they went to St. Petersburg where they don't recognize the revolution, but when the revolution came along, it wanted to draw, Lenin wanted the Russians out of the First World War. That would have been absolute calamity for the English because as long as the Russians were fighting the Germans, the German troops were occupied on the Eastern Front. If Russia came out of the war, all those troops on the Eastern Front would now come westward and be able to fight against the British and the French who were at that time losing the war. Therefore, uh, that is their interest in getting the Zionists on their side to influence Jews around the world. So when we talk about the, um, His Majesty's government view with favor, I'm trying to be objective here. What chutzpah? What chutzpah of the British government? The, the people in charge were the, Tur were the Ottoman Empire. They'd been there for 499 years and seven months. And here you have the British government issuing a declaration of sympathy to a land they didn't even have a foothold in. This is important. It wasn't as if, you know, they're in charge, a bit like Cyrus, you know, with Ezra and Nehemiah 2,000 years ago. The Babylonians are in charge. They issue a declaration, and Ezra and Nehemiah come back to Eretz Israel. They're in charge, but the British are not in charge. The other thing is establishment in Palestine. As I said, Palestine, no one knew what it was. It had never been an independent state. It was a geographical expression. I'm not talking about politics today. No one knew what it meant, and the Zionist movement didn't know what it meant. So the other important thing is a Jewish home in Palestine. And many people who criticized Britain afterwards for having betrayed the national home, the British did not betray the national home because it said there would be a national home in Palestine. What does that mean? 10, 10 feet? 100 yards? Uh, could it be a kilometer? 20 kilometers? 50 kilometers? In Palestine. But the important word over here of a national Jewish home, not the Jewish national home, a national home. No one knew what the word national home meant. It had no legal we know what a state is, but a national home is a reservation for Aborigines. What does it mean? Over to you, Charles. Next okay, slide. So coming back to the issue of what is Palestine. In fact, this was discussed, and I have here from the Peace Conference of 1919 with the Council of Four, which was America, France, Great Britain, and Italy. And at that conference, they are discussing what is Palestine. So here is a map 
which you can see or you can't see, Palestine yeah, but is But it the, says 1922 here. Yeah, I know, but we've got... Okay. We got, this is basically a geographic, you know, we won't get bogged down on the actual date. But whether Palestine includes Transjordan or was it what Israel is today with the West Bank, but they did discuss it, and it's interesting, and if I could read it, because the writing is so small, that they talk about the eastern boundary of what was to be Palestine. And at the peace conference, they therefore exclude Transjordan and state that the eastern boundary of what they recognized in the peace conference of Palestine was the River Jordan, the Lake of Galilee, and straight down line as we know it today. Um, and of course, we've already said it wasn't to be of Palestine, but in Palestine. Okay, that was the achievement of the, where is it, of this object. That, in a way, was the end of the declaration. Mm -hmm. That was the promise of the Jews to have this part of what was the Ottoman Empire and is of and in or in Palestine. But as a result of the workings of the anti-Zionist lobby, Edwin Montague, who is famous for those of you who know North London, there's Montague Street, Montague Square, Montague this, that, and the other. He also, also Montague in Romeo and Juliet. No. Not quite the same. The, um, however, he was, he had some wonderful statements about his feelings. He declares most strongly, he said, I have been a British citizen, I'm an Englishman, and you are coming along to tell me that I no longer belong here, and I've got to go over there? because that is implied in a way in the Declaration. Says he, quoting, Judge of my consternation, when this Zionist business intrudes itself on the horizon, if you make a statement about Palestine as a national home for Jews, every anti-Semitic organization and newspaper will ask, what right a Jewish Englishman with the status at best of a naturalized foreigner has to take a foremost part in the government of the British Empire, he of course would be in India, the country for which I have worked ever since I left the university, England, the country for which my family has fought, tells me that my national home, if I desire to go there, therefore my natural home is Palestine? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And he actually accused that government of being anti-Semitic because you, by declaring that, are aligning yourself with anti-Semites and say, we do not belong here. If I can just add to this before we carry on, there's some interesting points here. Uh, when there, uh, as we probably all know, the, the Sephardi community controlled uh, all the functions, the major functions of Anglo Jewry until the middle of the, of the uh, Second World War. They called it the Cousinhood. The best book on it is by Chaim Bermont, who wrote the book in 1972. Now, the, with the influx of many Jews coming in from Eastern Europe, Jews, the established Jew, um, Jewry in this country, were very concerned that um, there was a creation of anti-Semitism. The Home Secretary at the time was Arthur Balfour. And Arthur Balfour sets up a parliamentary commission in 1902 to try and look at the aliens. And later on it came the Aliens Act. And I think in uh, 2005 there was a, a massive, a large exhibition in this country. And who does he invite? as an expert, Theodor Herzl. So Theodor Herzl, and yourself, you've been to Parliament as well, he comes and explains what he thinks could happen to the Jews. Instead of them coming to this country, they should go off to Palestine. The other thing is um, that Montague um, was a very complex figure in his family, and many Israelis have uh, made derogatory remarks about him being an assimilationist, a self-hating Jew. But that family, who um, I don't like the word keeping its vote because there are 613 of them and not everyone can keep all of them, but to the point that they had written in their will, if any of their family did not keep the orthodox 
laws, they'd be written out of the will. Lily Montague, who founded the progressive movement in this country, she was written out of Montague's will and his brother because she didn't keep with Orthodox Judaism. And the other thing um, which I, I think it is important to understand um, is that Montague was the minister for India. Now, if there was a declaration which was sympathetic to Jews, there was a large population of Muslims in India. And there would be unrest, violence, more soldiers would, and police uh, men and women would have to go to India, and that would cause a lot of problems for the Minister for India. All the points that Charles has raised before are important, but there are, as I said, uh, other, uh, other factors um, involved. And so if we sure. carry... Yeah. But, of course, he was not a member of the War Cabinet to which the declaration was, was being made and set up, although he himself was invited to attend and give his opinion because the ministers wanted to have somebody who was anti-Zionist as a, as a balance in whilst they were producing this. Montague, in fact, his father was the first Lord of Swaveling, and he was a religious man. He was halakhically Jewish, and in he stated that if any of his children would marry out then they would be cut off. Edwin Montague, in fact, had an interesting relationship with a woman. Called uh, Venetia Stanley. Yeah, but Asquith was also... The, 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 he had a menage a trois, sorry, but well, it's true. I wouldn't have said that in age where, but, you know. <laughs> they, um, there was an interesting relationship, but in the end, and he was dying, literally, to marry her. And it went on and on and on, and in the end, she agreed to convert. Eventually, she converted a man, but she was never faithful to him. She had numerous affairs, and even his own child, nobody's actually, most people think it wasn't actually It's getting his child. interesting, right? But when he died, nonetheless, he swore his absolute allegiance to his wife. He said as soon as Weizmann, Weizmann knew that Montague could now come to meetings to do with a declaration, he said, as soon as I saw the announcement, I was afraid we were done. He died when he was 54. Well. Okay, this, so, is, yeah, this is very important. And the um, question of um, why things I do in my research is I always try and think out of the box. So if I'm looking at uh, the Prime Minister's office in Israel, I actually map out throughout the whole of the last 50 years whose office is next to Ben-Gurion or Levi Eshkol or Golda Meir. So when I find that uh, Golda Meir didn't really like Yaakov Herzog, who, by the way, was going to be chief rabbi in this country in 1965, um, he found himself in the storeroom um, of the um, cabinet. And the other thing is, when I look at British ambassadors, and it's important to, to just add this, until the early 80s, the ambassadorship the British ambassadorship to Tel Aviv was the last post. It, that was the end of someone's career. It was only afterwards that this changed. And so what I do, and when you talk about who is in, who's in the know, who isn't, I look at where ambassadors have come from and where they go. What ideas do they bring with them? Where do they go on? So it's important for us to understand who is in the inner circle. Okay, so coming back to the declaration. So the basic declaration, as we've read, just repeated, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home, and that's the first time that expression was used. There is an enormous amount written in legal documents and other places about what this exactly means. If anybody wants to read a 20-page article, just let me know. Um, of a national home for the Jewish people, and we use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. But now come two extra parts which are now included. It being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. It doesn't say Arabs of Palestine, and there is a view that he was in fact alluding to the Christian communities. But for Montague, it's the next bit. All the rights and the political statement enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Don't worry, your status is assured. Can I just mention this is important because when the Zionist Congress met the first time in Basel at a casino which was vacated, so the Zionist movement started in a gambling hall, um, 
what was important that in the declaration in the Basel, it was there on clause number five, where it said there, and this was in the Zionist movement, that nothing should be done that will oppose, that will be contrary to the laws of um, Jews in their respective countries. And as Charles just mentioned, it's important. It's basically saying you can make an omelette, but don't break the eggs. And it's a bit of an understatement to say non-Jewish communities, because non-Jews were 95% of the population. Yeah. 95%. Yeah. Nearly 700,000. <laughs> <laughs> to, as we said before, 59,000 Jews. I think we'll just uh, come to the last bit of it and then ask you for any questions. Yes, yes. So the last bit goes, I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration, because we've already established it wasn't written to the Zionists, it was written to Lord Rothschild, if he would then bring it to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. And eventually it was brought, it was, and it was declared, and it was on the day the Jewish Chronicle came out, on a Friday, so the Jewish Chronicle could have, you know, in those days people used to read the Jewish Chronicle, and it had good stuff in it. Um, but let's, at this point, uh, take some questions. What I thought I'd do is, I'll take, say, three questions, and we'll address all of them. Uh, Roy Cook was in London during that period, in 1916 and 1919, um, and he actually played quite an uh, important role in getting all the powers together. Is there anything that you've heard about at all in this, uh, in this role? I know that he knew Chaim Weizmann, and he also was very aware of the developments uh, of the other leaders in the British government at that time. Did you, did you hear anything about that? Okay, we'll take three questions. So we'll take about okay. Ralph Cook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, this gentleman here. Oh, you want the mic? Yes. Yeah. Basically, um, we've heard you say that the uh, Balfour Declaration is not a legal document. We have now come to the uh, state where the Palestinian Authority and their supporters are endeavouring to disprove the Balfour Declaration. Therefore, you know, what is it? It's, what is the influence that it's had? Why has it had such an influence, and why are they trying to disprove it? Okay, the third question came from the back. Uh, we're no relative. Um, my question relates to the latter part of um, the sentence, which reads, uh, all the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Uh, how could any weight be put behind such a statement um, by somebody in this country, for any other country? And was there any weight behind that? Okay, and I'll just add one question, which I received a link. I get lengthy emails. I had a lengthy email last night from a lady who wanted to know that uh, did this mean a state? Was a state promised? Mm -hmm. So, although it was called national home, did they actually mean a state, or did they not? So we'll deal with that one as well. Do you want to deal with Ruff Cook? Um, Ruff Cook, um, the question is that there were a number of people who were involved in various things, but looking at the documents, and again, documents aren't all the be all and end all, I would say that Rabbi Hertz um, was very involved, Rabbi Hertz from the Hertz Chumash, who was very pro-Zionist, to the point that when he died in 1946, there wasn't a chief rabbi in this country for a year and a half because the anti-Zionist, Montague and Wadey Cohen, did not want a Zionist um, chief rabbi until they found Rabbi Brody, who was then in Australia, um, and for various reasons. So this idea of who is involved, I don't think, if there is, I would like to know, um, but certainly Hertz and, uh, and um, also uh, the Herzog, uh, Gaster, Gaster, Moses the Gaster, um, the Chacham. The other thing is, I mean, I'll give my points and then you can do it as well. You asked the question about if the, Palace, if the Balfour Declaration isn't a legal document, then why are they trying to disprove it? Because the Balfour Declaration, as far as the Palestinians and Israel's detractors, I like to use the word detractors, is basically the original sin. That's how they see it. In other words, and if you think about logically, there were 58,000 Jews living in Eretz Israel in 1918. By the time the British had left in 1948, there were 600,000 Jews. Okay, many of them had come illegally. But that, had there not been 
First of all, Israel was created not because of the Shoah, but despite the Shoah, because more people would have come on Aliyah. So because of the Balfour Declaration, therefore Jews came on Aliyah and they were able to be at least half the population in 1948. So therefore, if you disprove, if you go against the Balfour Declaration, you are delegitimizing Israel's right to exist. And there was only an early uh, desire to put in the word the reconstitution. Right. Uh, that were to be in the Balfour Declaration, but that was not, that wasn't allowed. It is an error often, even by our own board of deputies and other Zionist organizations, to sometimes talk about the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. It is the recreation, the reconstitution of the, or it's the creation of the modern state of Israel. But Israel has always been there, to, otherwise it implies that we are there because of the Shoah. So did they mean a state? And many people write that the best analogy is that the words a home for the Jewish people is something like a fetus and that it will naturally develop into a child which is the state. So there is the war cabinet for instance of which Lord Balfour himself was at. As to the meaning, Rosin, of the words national home to which the Zionists attacked so much importance, he understood it to mean some sort of British uh, America and other protectorate under full facilities would be given to the Jews to work out their own salvation and to build up by means of education, agriculture and industry a real center of national culture and focus of national life. It did not necessarily involve the early, early establishment of an independent Jewish state which was a matter of gradual development in accordance with the ordinary laws of political evolution. And the idea that a state would come about is mentioned by Balfour and many, many other people. But not at the time. But not. There were many people who, of course, stated in many times as well, the 1920, 1922, 23, that under no circumstances did we ever mean a state. And within one year, in fact, of the Balfour Declaration, the British government itself was trying to withdraw slightly. This, by the way, is important to understand Israeli politics today and also to understand the problems between Ben-Gurion on the left and Jabotinsky on the right. And that is, you cannot declare a state unless you are the majority. And this is a problem with Jerusalem today. 40% of all the inhabitants today of Jerusalem are not Jewish, 40%, and it goes up every year 1%. So one of the questions is, the Jews didn't demand a state, because how can 58,000 people have a state. Um, what is understood by that is something else. But then coming back to your question about Jews in other countries, which is lesser known, is that the Americans, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, supported uh, the Balfour Declaration, but there was also pressure from non-Zionist Jews and anti-Zionists in America on the British government to include that. And I said before that if you look at Germany, and if you look at America, if you want to go and daven to pray and you see that the synagogue is called temple, then you know it's not an orthodox synagogue. Why? Because the German Jews, the American Jews who have temple, the temple is the Mishkan. The temple is the Mishkan and they do not need the yearning for Zion. So the pressure was also, if the Americans were going to support it, this also came uh, from from the American Jews. Before we end, um, it's interesting to, yeah, in a second, I've answered your question before you asked it. The, um, you could be an Israeli. Yes. On this matter of the number of people living there, in fact, the war cabinet it deals exactly with that point and mm -hmm. says they can't call it a state because there aren't enough Jews there. They're a tiny minority there, but how can they? So it said, the War Cabinet, it did not attempt to establish a Jewish state or to promise its future establishment, but it did intend to give the Jewish people, through the interim solution of the national home, the opportunity to become, quote, a definite majority of the inhabitants and to make Palestine a Jewish state once again. Uh, we ask you give the vote of thanks this evening. But before I do, I'd just like to say 
as Jeremy's already mentioned, uh, but I'm a volunteer at the University of Bengal University Foundation in London, and um, I've come to promote the event this evening. Um, the next time you're in Israel, I urge you to take a train from Britannia, to take a train from Tel Aviv, and even from Yerusha Line, and go down south to see Be'er Sheva and the university. When you get off the train in the center of the town, you, you realize that you have the desert landscapes, you've got the clean air, you've got uncongested traffic, no, relatively uncongested traffic, and you sense the quality of life down in Beersheba, which is why it's a booming town, which is why a lot of Israelis are going down there now to live for that, <clears throat> for that quality of life. The university is at the center of the town. It embraces the town, and the town embraces the university. There are cultural synthesis between the two. It's the fulfillment of David Ben-Gurion's vision to establish and develop the Negev for the Jewish people. Um, it is Israel's cybersecurity capital, as Jeremy's mentioned, or the film mentioned this evening, and it is Israel's Silicon Wadi. I can tell you that the army are relocating to Beersheba as we speak about 12,000 uh, cybersecurity experts, uh, soldiers, to Beersheba to work in conjunction with the university because the, Israel, the, the university has such an established cybersecurity center. In fact, when I was in Israel in May this year for the Board of Governors meeting, an American donor pledged approximately $15 million to open the cybersecurity building in uh, the university in, in, in May of this year, cut the, cut, cut the ribbon. I, I'd like to take this opportunity to just read to you um, a small text from um, what um, Yes Minister, as we started this evening with the flyer, which said, uh, had an a, 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 um, excerpt from Yes Minister, um, Bernard and Sir Humphrey discuss as yet unwritten minutes of a cabinet meeting. Bernard says, so you want me to falsify the minutes? Sir Humphrey says, I want nothing of the sort. It's up to you, Bernard. What do you want? Bernard, I want to have a clear conscience. Sir Humphrey, a clear conscience. Bernard, yes. Sir Humphrey, when did you acquire this taste for luxuries? Well, I have the luxury this evening to thank uh, Nathan and to thank Charles for their forensic examination of why Lord Balfour and the British government supported um, a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. And I think I can say on your behalf that we view with favor their examination of, of, of the reasons for it. I'd also like to thank uh, the tech team tonight. Jeremy's already done it, but I'd like to say again my thanks for uh, Jeremy Cohen and Tony Honigsberg to uh, set up all the technical things for this evening. And to mention to you that this will be recorded and placed on YouTube. It's one of the first time it's been done by Ezra Shul. So if anybody wants to revisit anything that's been said tonight, and there's been a lot said, um, you can go on YouTube, I don't know when it's going to be, and see, see this event again in live, live time. I'm teaching a class on diplomacy, and I always quote Lord Armstrong, who was Secretary of the Cabinet, and this is your thoughts, um, who wrote, um, the great ones have gone to their drinks and their dinner. The secretary stays getting thinner and thinner, racking his brains to record and report what he thinks they think they ought to have thought. So just to continue the thanking Tony and uh, Jeremy, I'd like to thank also uh, David Landau for his support this evening, the office at, uh, in the shul, the, the uh, security team, and also um, Hannah and uh, Jeremy. And, um, and, and, and all the caretaking team. I know we'll be back here next week, this time, not quite this time, on Wednesday evening. The event won't be recorded, but um, I'd like to take this opportunity of uh, wishing you all a Shana Tovah. <laughs>